Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this short episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, I'm joined by Kanish Chug from ETF Securities as we dive in to the ETF Securities NAM India Nifty 50 ETF or NDIA on the ASX. This is a quick fire episode where we go through the opportunity for investors looking at India as well as some of the key companies hidden within this ETF and some of the risks. I hope you enjoy this short episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. Kanish, mate, thanks for taking some time to join me on the program. Always a pleasure. No, Alan, thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a delight to talk ETFs. And today we're going to do a bit of a, a rapid fire kind of episode where we talk about one of the ETFs that's really interesting in the Australian market, and that is the ETF Securities NAM. I think that's how you pronounce it, NAM. Mm-hmm. India Nifty 50 ETF. So it's on the ASX by the ticket code NDIA. And yes. the reason why I say this is interesting is for a few reasons. Obviously, it's, it's quite popular amongst investors who are thinking from a top-down macro approach. What is the next you know, region, market, um, country that I want to be exposed to? You know, We've seen this tremendous economic success from China. So what's the next market? Naturally, everyone look over the border to India um, with a huge population and obviously a lot of technology um, and industrial focus. But for years, it's been very hard for Australian investors to get exposure to India and in particular, the Indian stock market for a very, there's been over the years, there's been a fair few reasons why that's been the case. One of them being that it's actually very difficult to buy direct stocks. Um, So maybe we can just start off with, uh, you know, I guess, why did you guys come out with this, this product, this ETF and what's the opportunity there for investors? I think, Owen, you know, to, to take your mind back, so we launched this fund in August 2019. So it's, it's coming up to sort of it's just it's just ticked over two years now. The fund itself was the first passive ETF that provided investors exposure to the India market specifically within Australia. So what previously were Australian investors going to do if they wanted Indian exposure? Um, well, there was one option they could buy an active manager, of which there were a few around. They could buy a broad Asia equity ETF, which had, it, and that's interesting, I'll get to on, onto that in a minute, but some of those actually have zero exposure to India. Um, they could buy a, an emerging market ex- ETF, for example, as well. And again, the exposure to India was, was minimal relative to their overweights that they have to China, which current you know, settings is quite risky given the regulatory sort of crackdown that the Chinese government's doing on some of their companies and even their celebrities, for example. So the reason why we launched it was we felt that there was a gap in the market. We felt that India has always been talked about as being this, you know, the next China. It's the elephant of Asia, whatever you want to call it. it. It has a lot of growth potential. And for whatever reason, it's taking a long, a long time for India to reach its potential. And it's still moving towards that direction. I don't think it's reached its potential yet. Um, India is the world's largest democracy. It's over 1. You know, 1.1, 1.2 billion people in population. It is very differently run to how, say, China is run. But a lot of mm-hmm. people would say is it's where China was 10, 15 years ago. But it will take a little bit longer. It will take its own process and its own way to get to where China is now, but it will get there. So for us as an ETF provider, we want to provide solutions to investors. We are open to saying, you know, there are solutions for every type of investor. And India was a solution that investors were wanting. And we launched it in 2019 um, as the first passive ETF tracking the India market. And to your point, you mentioned, you know, it's very difficult for investors to actually access Indian equities. Um, yes, you can do it via a, via a managed fund. You can do it via a broad 
region um, ETF, mm -hmm. but you can't actually invest directly into India. And to put it in perspective, we are a fund manager. This is our bread and butter. We do this all day. We, we you know, manage people's money on, you know, on, for, on their behalf. It took us over a year to set up the India fund. And the reason it took mm -hmm. us over a year was setting up the regular, going through the regulatory sort of red tape and setting up the accounts for the trading accounts, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long process and it's also a hard process to do. So it's not something that just anyone can sort of tomorrow decide I'm going to jump onto Comsec or, you know, Bell Direct or whatever they use and say, I'm going to invest in an Indian stock. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another reason. It's the limited access that you had. Um, so for us, you know, really happy and really proud to, to launch that fund and giving people, you know, an ability to invest in the Indian market. So the index that we track, which is, as it, you know, we speak about ETFs a lot and essentially a neat passive ETF tracks a benchmark. For NDIA, the benchmark that we're tracking is the Nifty 50 index, mm. which essentially is the 50 largest companies within the domiciled in India um, by size. So it's funny, some of these companies are actually larger than the largest Australian company. So this is the scope of it, but a lot of people aren't aware of, you know, the India market, the outlook and the companies that are involved. Yeah, it, the Nifty 50 is the kind of the index, right? When you think of India, if I'm not mistaken, that would be the one that most people look to, right? Yeah, definitely. So it's like our ASX 200. That's the best way yeah. to think of it. Yeah. 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 So within the ASX, oh, sorry, not the ASX 200, within the Nifty 50, you have very similar kind of breakdown in sectors compared to the ASX 200, which is I'm looking on your website now. Your current portfolio in the NDIA ETF is 37% to financials. Mm -hmm. um, IT is it's actually quite a bit heavier, which is 18% IT, energy at 12%, and materials at 8% 8, 8 and then it goes down from there. Can you give us a, a sense of some of the companies inside the, the ETF and, and what they do? Yeah, so I think on the financial side, <clears throat> yes, it's a very similar makeup to when we look at Australia in terms of the financials element. We need to remember, though, what type of financials are they and what mm. is the story behind India? So to get to the beginning of that, though, people are investing in India for the consumption story. They're mm. investing in India for the growth potential. They're not investing in a mature market. They're investing in a fragmented market and a fragmented industrial market. So in all respects, India is moving towards a space where as a country, they're going to operate in unison, you know, with all the states and the government at the federal level is trying its best to do what it needs to do in terms of reforms to ensure that occurs. Some of these reforms aren't popular. Um, some of these reforms probably could be more well thought through. Um, before they're being implemented. But again, it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing when you're dealing with the largest democracy in the world. They have to adopt a bit of a stance on how they, how they approach these things. And for the most part, the reforms that they're doing are, are going to be of benefit to, to the economy and to the people. What I think with the sector breakdown, so when you talk about financials, what type of financials is it? And it's actually retail financials. So it's companies like HDFC. Now, that is the largest financial institution within India. Within, within India. It's Housing Development Financial Corporation. And essentially, HDFC has a bit of a monopoly, or not a monopoly, it has, has, has quite a large market share within that private retail banking sector. And that is what you want to have exposure to. If you're thinking about consumption, India's middle, middle class is roughly around 500 million people. You know, you talk about the growth in terms of poverty and they're expecting that about 25 million households are going to be lifted out of poverty by 2030. So that's reducing that percentage of our households in poverty from 15% from about, you know, 2019 to less than 5%. So all of a sudden you see this big middle class that's growing. Then there's going to be a need for retail banking. There's going to be a need for credit. So that is what, India's financial sector is really focusing on. Here in Australia, when we talk about banks, it's very much institutionalized. Mm. There's a retail element to it, but a lot of the growth, a lot of the revenue is driven by at an institutional level. And mm. in India, it's just a case of opening up bank accounts, um, obtaining some form of credit. You know, you have to think back in terms of the psyche of the Indian consumer. And you think about it in terms of 
the Indian consumer would not normally take out a mortgage. They would not get a car loan to buy a car. They would save the money and purchase the house, the car, or any luxury item, any large ticket item in a, sort of a, a single purchase. They wouldn't mm. take credit for it. So all of a sudden, the credit market, whether it's at the credit card level, at the mortgage level, at a car loan level, it opens it up. So there's now potential for increased credit growth. Sometimes that's not always a good thing to have, you know, really high credit, mm. um, but they've got a potential to even grow from a very low base. And that's where a lot of those financials are, are looking at. And then you look at the sort of the other sectors, things like IT. So it's companies like Tata Consultancy or Infosys um, or Wipro. Now, Infosys, if you've watched the Australian Open recently, you would have seen some of these companies actually now advertising and they essentially provide outsource IT consulting or consultancy services to, um, to major uh, multinationals, et cetera, around the world. So they are operating from a service-based um, respect. Then you think about, you know, materials or you look at, you know, energy and energy, for example, is Reliance Industries. Now, Reliance Industries is the largest holding in the NDIA ETF. As I said, it's a nifty 50 index that it tracks. It's about 10% currently mm. of the holding as at the end of August. Um, and Reliance Industries is a unique company itself. It's a company that is a petrochemical company, um, but at, at its bread and butter. And that's where a majority, about 60% of its revenue is coming from petrochem um, operations. But it's actually moving into being India's largest telecommunications provider and also its largest provider of retail services so retail shops whether it's jewelry supermarkets etc that is where reliance is moving towards a diversifying their revenue stream whether they decide at some point to split up those three areas into individual um, subsidiaries or whether they keep them as one um, but it, you know reliance industries it's the largest company in india it's actually i think by market cap larger than the largest Australian company um, uh, at the moment as well. Hmm. So can you talk us through, that's a really interesting one with Reliance Industries. I've mm. followed that over time and it's shift towards telco offering super, super cheap yes. um, connections for hundreds of millions of people. Mm. And the uptake of that is just extraordinary. Um, can you talk a bit about like the ETF itself? How is, like how many stocks are in the portfolio? Hedged, unhedged. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about like the portfolio construction. So the, the ETF itself, it, as I said, attracts a nifty 50. So it has exposure to the 50 largest companies in India. So it's 50 stocks, essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. It has its rebounds every quarter, um, but there's not much movement in terms of the change of mm -hmm. names in those companies um, with a lot of the big market cap indexes that or the market cap ETFs, whether it's the nifty, you know, the NDIA ETF or, you know, ASX 200 ETFs, you don't see much changes in the names of the companies, but you may see some movement, you know, go moving up or down in terms of their rankings. The ETF itself, it's unhedged. Um, and so for us, in terms of the currency between the Australian dollar and the Indian rupee, it's actually been quite stable um, over the past 10, 15 years. There hasn't been much volatility within that currency, um, volatility between that. And then the last thing I think to point out is the actual ETF has to take into account certain tax implications that, that occurs when you hold Indian stocks. And that, again, is just another level of why an investor from Australia would not want to purchase or not look to purchase the actual stock, you know, let alone the access, but all the other sort of admin and the tax potential consequences. So the ETF has to take handle of that as well. Um, from, a, from a fee point, it's 0.69% per annum if you held the fund for one year. So what does that mean? You know, for $1,000, if you held it for one year and that $1,000 stayed um, uh, sort of constant, the fee would roughly be about $6.90. That's your fund management fee. And then obviously as an investor, you would have to might pay you know, your brokerage costs, et cetera, mm. associated with trading or holding that, that ETF. So can you just double click on that? Um, the tax situation again. Can you just give us um, an example of uh, that playing out, like in terms of the benefit of having it in the fund? Yeah, so essentially what we have to do within the fund is we have to account for potential gains that on the holdings that we have. 
So we have to accrue that within the fund. So there's a potential cost that the fund has to incur as a result of holding Indian equities. Now, right. as a result, the performance on the fund and the benchmark performance, which is obviously what we're trying to replicate, may be slightly different. And that is right. part and parcel of holding Indian stocks. It's sort of, if you're holding it from an outside perspective, that is just something that you have to face and you have to try and work through the best solution to, to manage that. And for us, we're managing that by accumulating, you know, and taking into account and forecasting those costs and those tax consequences of the underlying holdings that we have. So it is, mm. again, just another level of complexity that goes with holding Indian shares and Indian stocks. It's, you know, I think it's a, a country that has so much red tape, um, which they're trying to streamline at the moment, but it is, you know, something makes that makes it very difficult then for an investor to invest in India, which is why an ETF becomes a really easy solution to do so. Mm. And, you, you know, from, from where we sit, it's, potentially something that people really need to, I guess, open up their eyes. They, they sort of know a lot about China. They say, okay, Chinese um, as a market, the China market, it's going really well. There's some really big companies in there. Everyone knows about them. There's a really good growth story there, but what about the rest of Asia? Um, mm. And so don't be fooled into thinking that you have Indian exposure or Indian market exposure if you hold a broad Asia market fund um, because you might not even have any exposure to India. Um, so one of the largest broad Asian ETFs in the market actually has 0% exposure to India. And mm. which is why we're saying, you know, just do your research, pick, you know, really open up and, and lift up the hood of those ETFs and understand if you want Indian exposure, well, then there's options available to you, like a single country um, avenue such as NDIA. Um, yeah, because I was going to bring up the, I guess, the tracking error to the index because it is wider than your other products. So I was interested to know why that was the yep. case, but I guess it makes sense. Um, as we record this September 1st, 2021, since inception um, on the fund is around about 11%. So just, just shy of 11%, which is pretty impressive um, over the last few years. So good start. A um, couple more things I might ask you is um, one just around, you know, when people are investing through in the ETF, um, should they be thinking of this ETF as, you know, what we call a, a core or a tactical ETF? Like how would you perceive people using and investors using this ETF in a portfolio? So the way in which I, I, I sort of envisage this being used in a portfolio is as a satellite component. So yeah, right. it is not a core, it is a growth allocation. If you think about where India can be in five, 10, 15 years, it is a market that will grow and will be, you know, one of the biggest economies in the world. But mm. In that journey, you're going to have bouts and periods of some volatility. And some of those are going to be driven by global events, whether it's COVID-19, and we've seen that more recently. Some of those could be driven by more domestic um, policies from the government, for example. And we saw that when they tried to put some you know, demonetization reforms, for example. Um, but overall, it is a growth, um, it's a growth area, it's a growth theme. And it's a satellite component. So in the same way you're looking to use and allocate to Asia or to China, I would take that same view and how you allocate to India. Allocating it to it from a tactical perspective, which is very short to medium term, I think it's always hard to time the market generally, mm. whether it's the Australian market, whether it's you know the US, it's probably going to be even harder to time the Indian market because, as I said, it's going to have potential sort of bouts of volatility um, and fluctuations in that journey, but it will continue to grow in the long term. And as you mentioned, you know, since inception, the fund itself has had really strong return of about 11%. Um, you know, even looking back in terms of where it sits as, as at the, now these, this data I've got here, it's to the end of July. Um, it's not to the end of August, but over five years, the annualized return on the index, because obviously the ETF is only two years old, but the annualized return on the index is roughly around 12.6%. So again, in between those, there would have been some potentially leaner years, um, but you know, over the past one year, I think it's up nearly 47% to the end of August. Um, yeah. So significant outperformance, especially when you consider broad Asia, broad emerging and China specifically. Mm. So is it, it's, yeah, in my opinion, it's definitely one of those ones that's 
perfect for a, a tactical exposure or satellite exposure to to a market that if you believe India is you know going to keep marching forward economically hmm. um, there are some great businesses in India indeed and it's been so hard to access for such a long time um, okay so just in conclusion then if people wanted to find out more information um, see what's in the portfolio see how it's constructed where could they go so the best place to go would be our website so www.etfsecurities.com.au and mm-hmm. if you they hover their mouse over the product section um, sort of tab they can click on our NDIA fund there. And once you're on the product page, there's some useful content, whether it's articles that we've written, it's just information on the fund itself. You can download the fact sheet. I obviously recommend people downloading the product's disclosure statement, um, but you can also download the holdings. Um, now, mm. as I said, every quarter, the index rebounds So the names may not change in between each quarter, but the weights will. And you can just get a, uh, an idea of what's actually held in the fund and there's some interesting companies in there, companies like Hindustan Unilever. It's the only country outside of the Netherlands that Unilever is listed. Um, and it's actually the Indian um, sort of version of Unilever. So mm. it's separate to the parent company Uni- of Unilever. Unilever has about a 62% stake in Hindustan Unilever. But and, a con- and Hindustan Unilever contributes about 10% to Unilever's global sales. Um, and so this is a company that you know, is benefiting from that growing middle class, educating um, on, you know, basic, you know, from the basic hygiene principles. Um, If you think about, there's about 200 million people that may not use the standard toothpaste that you and I use. Um, They may use a version of a natural toothpaste or, you know, may not. But see, again, in that just one antidote, there is a large market in itself Mm. just for one product um, for a company like Hindustan Unilever and there's, you know, Reliance Industries and, you know, even the largest motorcycle company in the world is based out of India, um, which is Hero Motor Corp. Mm. So, yeah, so it, it's some, some really interesting stories um, that come yeah, out of there yeah. that people may not be aware of. Yeah, cool. Okay. So you can find out more by going to etfsecurities.com.au um, and you'll see the, the product page there for the NDIA ETF. Kanish, mate, always a pleasure to chat. Thanks for taking some time today. No, thank you for having me on.